When I look at the periodic table, and I know that it's separated basically into metals on the left, nonmetals on the right, the metals have a greater tendency to lose electrons than the nonmetals do. My students are well aware of that throughout the year. But what happens if I give them two metals to compare? Which metal would have a greater tendency to lose or to gain electrons? This is a harder question. And so we're going to move to the board real quickly and look at a very common reaction that we share with our students. We're going to look at zinc metal reacting with copper ions in solution. Let's see what happens. Here on the table we have a strip of zinc metal and a solution of copper sulfate. Copper sulfate is soluble so the solution will contain copper ions plus two and sulfate ions. Let's take the strip of zinc and dip it into the solution. there is a spontaneous reaction. Let's try the same thing with a strip of copper metal. The copper metal is going to be dipped into a solution of zinc sulfate. No reaction occurs. So, if we go back to the board, we see from the experiment that the zinc metal reacts with the copper ions in the solution, but the reverse reaction, where the copper is placed into a solution containing zinc ions, will not react. This reaction moves only in the forward, reaction, in the forward direction, as you see it here on the board. So, zinc has a greater tendency to lose electrons, copper has a greater tendency to gain electrons. If we were to take, let's go back to the desk now, and we're just going to use the copper solution. We're going to take a paper clip and pa place a paper clip into the copper sulfate. Again, a spontaneous reaction occurs. We'll try just laying it down on the countertop there and hope that you can see that there is a deposit on the paper clip. Well, a redox reaction has occurred, both an oxidation and a reduction, but it's occurred in the same container, one container. Wouldn't it be great if we could take the two reactions, the two half reactions that are occurring, do them in separate containers, connect the two containers by a wire, and allow the electrons to flow from one reaction to the other? If we did that, then we could take that flow of electrons through the wire and use that. Use that current to either ring a bell, light a light, or do some other type of productive work. This is what happens in voltaic cells. Voltaic cells are sometimes referred to as batteries. Using a battery to make a non-spontaneous reaction occur is what happens in electrolytic cells. And so we're going to look at some electrolysis reactions. We're going to do some electroplating. You can take a inexpensive metal, coat that metal with another metal to make it appear either more beautiful or give it a slightly different function, perhaps make it less uh, corrosive. And there's lots of applications for this. So what we're going to do now is we're going to set up an electrolytic cell and we're going to do some copper plating. The first thing we want to do is determine at which electrode the copper will plate out. And to do this, we've set up this system. Very simple. we have 
two graphite pieces. These are just pencil leads, 0.9 millimeter pencil leads, attached to two paper clips, which are then attached to a battery. All right, we're going to use these as our two electrodes. And for this reaction, we're going to use a 96 well, uh, 24 well plate. And we're going to fill one of the wells with a copper sulfate solution. All right, we're going to take this and simply put it into the well and look for a reaction to occur. We want to observe what's going to happen on the, at the anode and the cathode, at the red lead and at the black lead. Do you see the production of the gas bubbles? Let's lift these out for just a second. Can we see the deposits on the tips of the uh, electrodes? I might even try this one just in the cup as well. Let's see. There's a gas. Is the camera picking up that? Why don't you try putting them down? Oh, just I can a see little, the bubbles coming real nicely now. Just a little bit now. deeper. There you go. And there's a nice, pre nice precipitate growing on this side as well. Mm -hmm. The black lead has a precipitate depositing on the uh, graphite rod and lots of bubbles at the red lead. I'm going to take this out now and just lay it on the counter because I think you can even see from the coloration or a prediction that you might have for what has formed at the black lead. Okay, let's go to the board for just a second. <clears throat> At the black lead, it's very obvious that there was a deposit forming there. The reaction that's occurring is that we're taking the copper plus two ions and we're forming copper atoms from the coloration of the deposit on the, on the graphite rods, you can see sort of a copper color. This is going to occur if two electrons are added to the ions. Now, the copper is gaining electrons. Gaining electrons is reduction. Reduction here is occurring at the cathode. And because it's a non-spontaneous reaction, this is going to be our negative terminal. Now the other reaction, because we have both an oxidation and a reduction occurring at the same time, what would that be? Well, we have the formation of a gas. And in this case, water is decomposing. And if we look at the fact that oxygen in the water is minus 2, Hydrogen is plus one. If this is going to be our reduction, this is where the electrons are going to be lost. Electrons are going to be lost here. And the oxygen, with its minus two charge, is going to lose electrons to form O2 gas. I would have to lose four electrons for an O2 molecule to form. 
So we have both our oxidation and our reduction occurring. If we're interested in depositing copper, if we want to electroplate copper onto another metal surface, then we want to make sure that the metal we want to plate is going to be at the black electrode, our cathode. So let's go back to the table. We have a small 24 well plate. The battery is connected to two terminals and at the end we have paper clips from the leads and here we have a copper coil. It's shaped like an S and placed into one of the wells which contains our solution of copper ions, copper sulfate. The metal that we're going to plate is going to be this paper clip. Notice we've decided from a previous, the previous experiment that this is going to be connected to the black lead. So as soon as we dip the paper clip in, we just don't want the two to touch, let's see what we can observe. Look at the deposit on the paper clip now. It's very fast. Is that a good view? Let's think about the reactions that are occurring here and the difference in this setup versus our previous experiment. Back to the board one last time. <clears throat> well, the copper was deposited at the cathode. So we have the same reaction here. Copper plus two ions gaining electrons to form copper atoms. The question is, did you see anything occurring at the other electrode, the anode, which was our red lead? I didn't make any observations there, did you? I didn't see anything happening. I don't think so. And this is, this is something where you say, is no reaction occurring? But let's think about what's happening. If this reaction is occurring, copper two ions are being depleted from the solution. They're being removed from the solution as they played out as copper atoms on the surface of the paper clip. At some point, we're going to run out of copper atoms or copper ions in the solution and we'll no longer be able to form the copper atoms. So we need a constant supply of these ions. What we had at the red lead, our anode, was the S-shaped copper coil. At this electrode, the reverse reaction was occurring. The copper metal that was placed into the 24 well plate is going to lose its two electrons, forming copper plus two ions so that there is a continual supply of electrons for this second reaction allowing the copper to continue to plate out. This is often referred to as a sacrificial anode. Now, there's all kinds of excuses you can have for not wanting to do electrochemistry in your classroom. Maybe it's at the end of the year and you don't get to it. But look at all the wonderful reactions that we have here. Some of the things that we use very early in the year as we're talking about displacement reactions. Money, time, when you're doing things microscale, look how quick and easy the experiments were, not requiring anything more sophisticated, more expensive than a nine volt battery. Give it a try in your classroom. It will really enhance the science that you're teaching your kids.